Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott from Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue. Uh, welcome to our teaching ministry. This is our Wednesday night Torah study, uh, where we go through the Torah portion for each week, and we just discuss it here in this fashion. Um, we spent some time in Naso, the current Parsha, last week. This is a part two of that, if you will, a continuation of that, if you will. There's some remarkable connections in Naso that I'd like to explore with you. But first, um, a, a couple mentions briefly. Uh, as always, please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel. Uh, we have uh, many teachings that are planned for this channel, and I'm hopeful that you'll be blessed. And if you subscribe, then you will get notice of our postings and, uh, and, and be able to, uh, to join us there. Also, for those who wish to support our ministry, you'll find links below to make your contributions online, or you'll find links below with directions for mailing a contribution if you prefer that method. For those of you who are supporting us already, and there are many of you who do, um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for supporting this ministry. Uh, Adonai is doing uh, many new things in the ministry of Beth Yeshua, and we are eagerly anticipating uh, much harvest from the work that he has planned for us to do, that he has called us to do. So for those who have partnered with us, I, I pray that Adonai will bless you greatly, and uh, I just wanted to express my thanks and appreciation uh, for that, for your partnership with us in this ministry. Okay, let's begin uh, here. Uh, we're beginning in Naso, the current portion, uh, and you'll see a remarkable uh, set of instructions here. Again, this is a, a continuation of, of where we were at in the previous week in, in Naso, and we'll find there that uh, in Naso, of, of course, is uh, from B uh, Numbers, uh, Bamidbar, uh, chapter 4, verse 21, through uh, chapter 7, verse 89. Um, and so this is uh, what we have there in the, in the portion, but I want to draw uh, your attention to uh, the discussion of the soda. The soda is the woman who suspected of adultery in uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 11, and I'm just going to read through it here, uh, and, and you can follow along if you like. Verse 11 of chapter 5 of Numbers of the Midbar in the portion of uh, uh, Naso. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Bnei Israel and say to them, Suppose some man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, and another man has sexual relations with her, but it is hidden from her husband's eyes, and her impurity is not detected. Yet there was no witness against her, and she was not caught in the act. Then a spirit of jealousy overcomes him. He is suspicious of his wife when she is impure, or a spirit of jealousy overcomes him, and he suspects his wife, yet she is not impure. Uh, just to clarify there, uh, speaking, first of all, that the man may be jealous because she's impure, or he may be jealous, and she's, she, she has not been unfaithful. Verse 15, Then he should take his wife to the Kohen. He must also bring a tenth of an ephah of barley flour as an offering for her. He is, to, he is not to pour oil or put incense on it, because it is an offering for jealousy a reminder offering, uh, the Zochron offering, drawing attention to guiltiness. The Kohen is to bring her near and have her stand before Adonai. Then the Kohen is to take some holy water in a clay jar and some dust from the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. Then the Kohen will have the woman stand before Adonai, loosen the woman's hair, and put into her hands the reminder offering, the offering for jealousy, one while in the Kohen's own hands are the bitter waters that bring a curse. Then the Kohen will have her swear under oath, and say, then say to the woman, if no, other man other, if no man other than your husband has slept with you, and if you have not gone astray into impurity from your husband, may this bitter water that, you, that brings a curse not harm you. If, however, you have gone astray from your husband, and if you become impure and have had sexual relations with a man other than your husband, then the Kohen is to have the woman swear under this oath of a curse and say to the woman, Then let Adonai cause you to be cursed and denounce among your people when Adonai causes your thigh to rot and your belly to swell. May this water which brings a curse enter your body and cause your belly to swell and your thigh to rot. 
The woman is to say, Amen, Amen. Verse 23. Then the Cohen is to write these curses on a scroll and wash them into the waters of bitterness. The Cohen will then have the woman drink the bitter water bearing curses so that the water of the curses of bitterness enters her. The Cohen is to take the jealousy offering from the woman's hand, wave the offering before Adonai, and bring it to the altar. The Cohen is to take a handful of grain offering and burn it up in smoke on the altar as a memorial offering. The Cohen will then have the woman drink the water. When she is made to drink the water that carries the curse, if she has defiled herself and been unfaithful to her husband, it will enter her and cause bitterness. Her abdomen will swell and her thigh will waste away. She will be accursed among her people. If, however, the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, she will be free from guilt and able to have children. This is the Torah regarding jealousy. When a woman goes astray from her husband and defiles herself, or when a spirit of jealousy comes over a man, and he jealously suspects his wife. The Kohen is to have her stand before Adonai and apply this entire Torah to her. The husband will be free of guilt, but that woman will bear her guilt. Okay, so that was basically uh, uh, verse 11 through the end of the chapter, uh, chapter 5. Um, let's, uh, first impressions. Wow, that's a little bizarre. Um, let's, let's unpack it a bit. And, and see if we connect with any of the images and phrases and, and connect with any of the themes. Let's see if we can uh, start to make some sense of this beyond that of just uh, arcane and, and odd. Um, in the first place, I think this translation that I was using here is uh, Stern's translation, the Complete Jewish Bible. And I'm going to pull up on another screen a different translation, which is the Living uh, Tree of Life Bible. And let's uh, get to that. Thank you for your patience here. If I pull this up, and it has this, and I rot, and actually I'm wrong. That was, that may have been the, the TLV, and the one that I might want to bring to your attention is actually the Stearns translation. It is, it is, okay. All right, so uh, the first reading that I did was from the, the living, or not, sorry, the Tree of Life version. Um, the second one that I'm going to refer to is actually Stern's translation in the Complete Jewish Bible because there's some nuances of translation that he took that begin to open up the understanding of this passage um, somewhat, uh, well, significantly, honestly. Um, but, but let's go on. Uh, so we're going to unpack this a little bit. Let's begin with what we have here, the opening lines of this passage are rather emphatic. Uh, it is emphatic that the woman is guilty. There's a presumption of guilt here that is um, just undeniable. Uh, from the, uh, the Tree of Life uh, version, it says this, uh, suppose a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him. It's just point blank. She's been unfaithful. It's, it's presumed guilt. Another man has sexual relations with her, but it is hidden from her husband's eyes, her impurity is not detected. Then we begin to get into beyond the, that of, of presumption and absolute assurance of guilt to perhaps some ambiguity. Uh, it says, yet there was no witness against her. She was not caught in the act. So uh, did she really do this thing? And the spirit of jealousy overcomes him. He is suspicious of his wife. Well, you're not suspicious of somebody that is guilty. You're suspicious of somebody you think is guilty. And uh, when she is impure, or a spirit of jealousy overcomes him, and he suspects his wife, yet she is not impure. She's done nothing wrong. And so we started out with this just absolute cut and dried uh, statement of guilt, and, and we've evolved over the course of a couple sentences to, well, maybe she's not guilty. Maybe she's innocent. Maybe she's falsely accused. It says, then he should take his wife to the Kohen. He must also bring a tenth of ephah of barley flour as an offering, etc. Uh, it says here in this translation, a, a reminder offering, a zikron offering. It is this idea of, of the reminder, bringing things back to mind, uh, bringing things up again. Okay. Um, beginning with this presumption, we see the emotional weight of that moment, the betrayal, the injury, the dishonor, and, and then we, we, we almost do an about face, and we say, well, maybe she's not guilty of this. And then we have this ritual. Some of the commentators call this ritual a trial by ordeal. 
In other words, your guilt or your innocence will be determined by this ordeal or the outcome of this ordeal. But here's the thing. Why would a woman go through this ordeal if she's guilty? Why would she subject herself to this if she's truly guilty? So what's happening here? That we're going through all these steps, going through all these backflips. Some commentators might suggest that he's allowed to bring her and force her to go through this ritual um, and this spectacle uh, if he thinks she might be guilty. Well, a woman will either protest her innocence or she would, and, and then perhaps she would go through the ritual. But a woman who's guilty, I question whether that woman would subject herself to this spectacle. Perhaps she just says, okay, uh, cards on the table. Yes, I'm guilty. Let's move on. I don't need to be a spectacle. I don't need to go through this ritual. I'm guilty. Um, because the context of this ritual is that of determining guilt. It's not meant to be a punishment. It's not meant to uh, bring about the consequence for her sin. It's, been, it's meant to determine guilt, which is a, an important nuance to this passage. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, the woman does not have to go through this if she's guilty. Why would she? She's had an affair. She's been unfaithful. Uh, why would you subject yourself to this circus? Uh, so what began with a presumption of guilt has now switched over to where really the only real application of this ritual is to the innocent, to the one falsely accused. If she is to swear this oath, and with this oath comes a curse if she's found guilty. It begs a question for me. If you're guilty, don't, don't speak the curse. Don't speak the oath, and you won't be cursed. Now, here's the thing about... Fidel, uh, faithfulness um, in marriage. Nearly always the unfaithful spouse has some measure of justification, some measure of excuse. Nearly always the, the one who strays feels that they have a compelling reason to stray. If the woman is unfaithful, she's likely to have some measure of self-justification. Let's back up and examine the scene here. Let's, let's play this out. Uh, if you will, imagine yourself going through this, if you're the one being accused, or if you're the one who's doing the accusing. Um, so is this the product, is this moment, this scenario, is this moment the product of a healthy relationship? Is this product, is this, this moment, this scenario, the product of, of, of a good quality communicative uh, marriage? Um, and, and, and it, it, it does strike you pretty strongly that when you've gotten to this point, if it's come this far, then this marriage has likely got some pretty serious problems uh, to begin with. Um, in, in the, you know, and, and in, that, in, that, in that troubled marriage, in that turmoil of marriage, comes the self-justification for behavior uh, such as... Uh, um, being unfaithful, the betrayal. I'm not justifying the betrayal, I'm just elaborating on, on the scenarios by which a person would feel justified in, uh, in going down that road. Okay, in the, uh, the, uh, the Tree of Life version, it says that the curse will cause your belly to swell and your thigh to waste away. Uh, I mentioned Stern's translation is actually a little closer to um, a, a usable translation here. It says um, that if uh, when she um, let me pull it up here on this page and, uh, and, and see what I can find here. Um, it says here um, may this water that causes this curse go into your inner parts and make your abdomen to swell and your private parts to shrivel up. Uh, that's rather striking. Uh, it says, uh, make your abdomen to swell and your, your private parts to shrivel up. Uh, and the woman is to respond, amen, amen. Okay, um, looking at the ritual specifically, we, we've got this holy water in a clay pot, and then we take dust from the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. The Kohen will place the woman before Adonai and unbind her hair. And the Kohen makes her swear. And, and starting in verse 19, 
And, uh, and from this part, I am reading from Stern's Complete Jewish Bible, verse 19. If no man has gone to bed with you, the Cohen will make her swear this. If no man has gone to bed with you, if you've not gone astray to make yourself unclean while under your husband's authority, then be free from this water of embitterment and cursing. But if you have, in fact, gone astray while under your husband's authority and become unclean because some man other than your husband has gone to bed with you, Verse 21, then the Kohen is to make the woman swear with an oath that includes a curse. The Kohen will say to the woman, May Adonai make you an object of cursing and condemnation among your people by making your private parts to shrivel up and your abdomen to swell up. May this water that causes the curse go into your inner parts and make your abdomen swell and your private parts shrivel up. It repeats it again, and the woman is to respond, Amen, Amen. Then the Kohen writes these curses on a scroll, and he washes the letters of the curse off into what is called the bitter waters, and she drinks. If she has been unclean, the bitter waters will enter her and become bitter, and her belly will swell, and her private parts will shrivel up, shrivel up. She'll become the object of cursing. However, if she is innocent, we have this in verse 28. In verse 28 it says, But if the woman is not unclean, but clean, then she'll be innocent and will have children. So let's rewind the stage practically and, and, and set this up practically. You have a person who is presumed guilty of betrayal, but right away you're thinking that maybe she's innocent. If she's innocent, she's allowed to go through this bizarre and, and frankly very risky trial by ordeal to prove her innocence. What is happening that would bring a couple to this place? Think about the scenarios. The marriage is dissolved and disintegrated to the point of accusation of unfaithfulness. It's not a good or a healthy marriage. It's almost worse that she is wrongfully accused. This is a couple that is, is not doing well. So she is presumed and then accused of guilt. And, and look what it says at the, end, at the end of this ordeal. Then she will be innocent and will have children. The relationship is in trouble. Why would you bring children into this world, into this family? Uh, there are, are very real questions that, that could be asked of the text at this point. Uh, perhaps there are some cultural nuances that we're not familiar with that would allow us to, to make a little more sense of this. But just as a matter of, of, of real, immediate, you know, knee-jerk level reactions, yeah, this, this family's in trouble. Here are a couple connections that may help bring some understanding. When do we, when do we recall talking about bitter waters? We've just talked about this in our community. What, what have we talked about recently with bitter waters? It's the waters of Mara, the bitter waters where Moshe Moses throws a tree into the water and the bitter waters become sweet. So let me ask you a question, in what way are these two passages similar? They both refer to bitter waters. Is there a connection between these two passages? Well, in both passages they drink. In Mara, the bitter waters are made sweet for healing, and in this case, the water starts out sweet, but becomes bitter. So we have a similarity by contrast. Um, in the other passage, in the Mara passage, we throw a tree in the water. Um, in this passage, we're throwing dust from the floor of the tabernacle in the water. Um, and, and we already mentioned that we start out with the water starting out good, in this passage, but they turn bitter when the person drinks it if they were unfaithful. So we've got a few similarities that we can kind of uh, use to point us in a direction. Um, this is what I would say at this point, having just kind of looked at some really quick sort of questions in the passage. Um, we talked about the presumption of innocence versus the presumption of guilt, uh, the weight of burden of proof, and, and why would somebody go through this. Um, and if you want to take it a little bit further, the Talmud has some really fascinating discussion on this, uh, on the soda, and 
and actually exaggerates the scenario significantly um, for the purpose of, of understanding and for the purpose of discussion. Uh, so if you want to dialogue on that, then contact me and we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit. Um, again, Talmud is, is entertaining and, and instructive, um, but it's, it's not the word of Adonai. So uh, we use it the same way we would use any other book or any other commentary or any other uh, resource. It's, it's interesting and it's helpful sometimes, uh, but it's, it's not the word of Adonai. Okay, um, what does all this mean? Let, let's talk about it from this perspective. What is the purpose of marriage? Uh, what is the purpose of marriage? Uh, in, in a classical sense, in a Jewish sense, the purpose of, of marriage is to, for procreation, to bring children into the world, to increase and bring children. What was the connection to Mara, the waters of bitterness? What, what was it we were talking about with the waters of bitterness of, of Mara. It was the children who were killed by the Egyptians who were thrown into the waters of the Nile. And we see that Adonai had them go through this, and as a result of, of drinking this water that he healed them, and he, he presented himself to them as a healer. Uh, what is the result of the trial by this ordeal, by these bitter waters? It, it's not healing. It's guilt or innocence. If she's guilty, her private parts shrivel up. What is it referring to? What is the, the reference of private parts that Stern's translation is referring to? Um, what is it a possible reference to? But the uh, a woman's uh, uh, womb, her private parts, her reproductive parts, her ability to bring forth children would be shriveled up is what's happening here. Uh, if she's pregnant by infidelity, if she's pregnant perhaps by this unfaithfulness, uh, perhaps there is some sort of implication that, um, that maybe she wouldn't be able to give birth or this kind of thing. Uh, again, leading to the weight of this idea that the guilty person is not going to go through this. The one who's guilty is not going to go through this ritual. This ritual is for the person who's innocent. So if she's innocent, um, then she'll she'll bear children. The, the, the text is explicit. It says that. If she's guilty, she will be unable to bear children. Um, so once again, we have an ordeal by waters, waters of bitterness, connecting to bringing forth children. All right. As if the purpose of this ordeal, you could almost interpret it this way, the, the purpose of this ordeal, the purpose of this scenario, the goal of it is to bring forth children. Notice this in the last line. It says it here. It says, um, uh, this is the law of jealousy before that, verse 28. If the woman uh, is not unclean but clean, then she'll be innocent. We, we might like that. And it says this, she'll be innocent and will have children. It's almost like the purpose of this ordeal is to somehow bring forth children. That's the goal. But hold it. This marriage is in trouble. How do you bring forth children into this marriage? What is it that this marriage needs? This marriage needs uh, what you might call a reset button. It's almost as if this could be characterized as a bizarre ritual that is designed to give a sense of starting over. And, and, and playing out the scenario, you know, you, you come to the Cohen, you present your wife, whom you suspect of being unfaithful. You present your wife to him, you go through this ritual, and the, the commentators are mixed on whether the effects of this ritual are immediate or not. But it would almost need to be very, very quick. It would almost need to be immediate in order for, for it to, to, to be effective. I mean, otherwise, they're going to go back and they're going to wait for three months to see if her belly swells up. Um, you need it to be immediate because the, the jealous husband needs an immediate answer. All right. So assuming, perhaps, that the, the swelling of the belly is supposed to happen immediately and it doesn't happen. So now you're going to 
make the long walk back to your tent and you've got your wife with you whom you just publicly made a spectacle of and accused of of unfaithfulness and the last line you hear is she's innocent so now go bear children how do you get from accusation and suspicion and jealousy to bearing children there has to be some sort of processing in the relationship of, of what just happened you just accused me of unfaithfulness what just happened um, yeah I was suspicious of you because of this and this and this that's what just happened hopefully on the walk back to the family tent you have little else to talk about other than what just happened and you can maybe process this she can say you accused me wrongly and he can say you gave me reason to accuse you hopefully on the walk back to the tent you're able to reset the playing field you're able to work it out and why so you can bring forth children that's the goal of what's happening here this is the purpose of, of this ritual is to reset and to uh, allow the marriage to bring forth children all right so what does all this mean to us what is this bizarre ritual have to do and, and what is the value to, to us especially us in, in this modern age um, one application would be this one one way to go with it is this how often does our behavior betray our love of Adonai how often are we so overt in our passion in our adoration in our devotion to Adonai that others could see it and make note of it or rather let me phrase it this way could we be accused of unfaithfulness to Adonai this woman was somehow gave her husband a reason to accuse her I mean sure this could be irrational it could be extreme these kinds of things I understand that but there is in some case something in most cases there would be something that gave him reason that gave him pause um, could we be accused of unfaithfulness is there something in us that would give Adonai reason to accuse us reason to question us uh, you know we, we sometimes think of ourselves because Adonai can read our hearts so he always knows our intention and and we think oh well nothing really matters because he knows my heart but but we're not always innocent beyond all doubt we may be innocent in what we actually do but we may not be innocent above all doubt um, in, in one sense many of us are innocent of betrayal we don't actually betray Adonai but in another sense perhaps many of us have not maintained proper behavior that would avoid all suspicion it's this overlap many of us flirt with sin or with worldliness or with other things that might we might come close to worshiping them maybe we don't go all the way maybe we don't engage in overt idolatry but we do flirt with worldliness maybe we don't engage with with the the extremity of it but we dally a little bit on the edges what would be the equivalent to that in, in the context of what we've read here today well that would be the equivalent of a woman flirting but not being unfaithful and what does the husband say what does the husband do when his wife is flirting he assumes that she's being unfaithful that she's betraying him because that's what that behavior points towards she may not be it may be casual it may be fun it may be flirty but nothing happens nothing goes wrong nobody gets hurt but she could be accused of being unfaithful what I want to do is is draw attention that sometimes our behavior of flirting with the world maybe we don't go all the way 
Maybe we come close to worshiping the things of the world. But our husband might be jealous. Our husband might be growing suspicious. And I know we're going to dismiss that because, because Adonai knows our hearts. And so he knows if we do actually do anything wrong. But sometimes we get close to the edges. The purpose of marriage is to bear children. The purpose of our relationship with Adonai is similarly to bring forth, to bring something forth. In marriage, what is it that we bring forth? We bring forth children. We begat like kind. We bring forth other children. And this is a good thing. In the kingdom, in our relationship with Adonai, we bring forth, in, in our relationship with other people, our dynamic with other people, when we are good, when we are kind, when we are compassionate and decent and gracious, and loving and merciful, all these things in all these ways, we bring Adonai to the people. We present the good things, the, the good and perfect gifts of Adonai, we present these to the people. When we are good and compassionate and kind and decent and loving and merciful and gracious in all these ways, we also bring the people to Adonai. Uh, we, we have this moment this pivot point in, in the relationship and the posture between Adonai and the people of the earth. And we sit in this, this joint, we sit in this pivot point, and it was verbalized and described by Melchizedek, the, the priest that, that Abraham came to, when, he, when he, it says in the text that he blessed God and he blessed Abraham. That's our role in the earth, is to bless Adonai, and to bless the people. And this is what we do. We, we do this by being loving, by being compassionate, by being kind, by being fair, by being just. In all these ways, we do these good things. And when we do these good things, it, it has the effect of bringing Adonai to the people and bringing the people to Adonai. Okay. If we are flirting with the world to the degree that we might be accused of being unfaithful, then we find ourselves without the ability to bring the holiness of Adonai to the people. We find ourselves ineffective to some degree, and sometimes to a great degree. We find ourselves ineffective at bringing people to Adonai and bringing Adonai to the people. In a sense, we are again that pivot point, but we're only effective in that pivot point if we maintain the holiness of Adonai, if we maintain the love of Adonai, if we maintain the decency and the mercy and the kindness of Adonai, the minute we become any kind of accusation among other people, then we find that moment is compromised, that moment is made ineffective, and sometimes that moment is destroyed. And we're unable to complete that, of, of giving that gift to the people, the gift of Adonai to the people and giving the people to Adonai. So this is our burden. This is why we have to be careful to do nothing that would accuse us of being unfaithful. And when there is cause for suspicion, we have this ritual of the holy water and the dust from the floor of the tabernacle. The ritual of the holy water and the dust from the floor of the tabernacle, what are the holy waters? What is, what is this reference to holy water here? Well, for me, the pointer is to the waters that come from the throne of Adonai in the Revelation. And these waters are for the trees, for the healing of nations. What is this dust from the floor of the tabernacle? We have the, the, the floor of the tabernacle, which is going to be a profoundly holy dust from a very holy place and we have this dust what what is what do we think of when we think of the dust well when we think of the dust we think of creation man was formed out of the dust of the earth to me this dust from the floor of the tabernacle points to resurrection the the resurrection of the new man being created anew being created brand new because adam was shaped out of the dust of the earth the dust of the tabernacle in my mind, would be used to bring forth the new man that Adonai is creating in me. This is what has been offered to me. 
And so we find ourselves here with this profound description of the woman who is under suspicion. And if we're honest, we would have to say that we have at times been under suspicion in our lives. And we have this to establish guilt and to establish innocence. And it may be that some of us have dallied around the edges and could perhaps be described as not entirely unfaithful. But this ritual is here to give us pause, to give us a moment and say, wait a minute, how has our relationship degenerated to the point that I might be accused of being unfaithful? Would Adonai call you to this ritual? Would Adonai call you to walk through this in order to establish your guilt or your innocence? But that's not the real purpose of this. The, the final purpose of this, the final purpose of this, literally in the text, is to bring forth children. Establishing guilt or innocence repairs the relationship, and it gives the impetus, it motivates the parties to repair the relationship. I think that's one of the takeaways here. I think that's one of the teachings here, is that Adonai would like us to repair the relationship. If you have gotten to the place in your relationship with him where you've been lackadaisical, where you have flirted with the world, where you have found yourself perhaps uh, open to accusation, where people might be suspicious, because this is the, the truth of it. If, if a woman is unfaithful with her spouse, it's probably not just her spouse that is suspicious. There are other people in the community that are possibly likewise suspicious. And here again, this public spectacle, this circus in the text, um, is, is public, and so now her innocence is going to be determined. But again, the other question behind the text is this, what about the suspicions? So here's my takeaway with this, is that Adonai is giving me a very powerful reminder of what it means for me to be under suspicion of having been unfaithful to him. And now that I've walked through this, now I take the long walk back to my tent with my husband, Adam and I. And I think about this. And I talk with him. And I say, okay, so you think that what I did was bordering on unfaithfulness? And yes, I have to agree. Now I see the, the cause of suspicion. And I don't want that. And, and, and what is the motivation but to honor Adonai, that honor that comes from a place of love? I, again, for me, one of the most powerful descriptions of this, images of this, is when Sarah called Abraham Lord. He was the one who rescued her, who redeemed her, who gave her a life, and she calls him Lord. And I don't know for sure the, the character and temper of their relationship, but just that moment when she calls him Lord for me is an indication of, of how my heart ought to be oriented towards Adonai. That I want to honor him above all suspicion because I love him. And that's where we end up with this, is thou shalt love the Lord your God. And that's what we want. And then we also want to be able to present his love to the people. And we can't do that if we could possibly be accused of being unfaithful to him or would perhaps be under suspicion of being unfaithful to him. So I'm going to conclude it there this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I just pray that Adonai blesses you and keeps you this week and, and gives you a, a week of peace, a week of blessing. And I uh, would encourage you to join us on Shabbat and uh, look forward to that and uh, and again next week if you like please reach out to me in the comments if you have any interest or questions or dialogue or discussion and um, and uh, would love to uh, discuss this further with you shalom shalom